Greetings, everyone. Um, it's good to be back with you again. We will be on the road tomorrow, so we will be back in town um, probably by Tuesday night, possibly Wednesday. And uh, it's, according, it's according to to how tired we are by the time we hit Augusta, because if we're really tired, we may stop in Augusta and sleep overnight there. But otherwise, we will be back no later than Wednesday evening. Um, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I hope that this finds you well. I'll be chatting with you about prayer requests, obviously. Um, we'll have by the time you see this. And uh, because of the limited uh, space and time and and opportunity to get connections to Wi-Fi, I'm just going to be conducting prayer requests through phone because I can't, I can't depend that I'm always going to have time and space to get these videos done here on the road. Um, anyway, Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 3 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another with bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Today is part two of the lesson. Be patient since you may be the patient. Part two. God, we love you. Let your word speak to us. Let us glean from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I mentioned in the last lesson how a close examination of the fruit of the Spirit soon reveals how all of these are actually different facets of one thing. In fact, if we look at the language of, of the scripture in Galatians where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it's not plural fruits. It's fruit. So it's like all these different aspects aren't different fruit. They're all one aspect of the same fruit. And, and we briefly examine how there's a relationship. I think it was between peace and joy. We saw a relationship and, and, and love and righteousness slash fairness, which if you look at the Greek definition of righteousness, it, it literally means equity or fairness. Um, and obviously love is in there. Love wants to be fair and, and, and good to all people equally. Um, and then we went in a little more depth to show the, the link between patience and humility. <clears throat> well, this scripture today, first of all, it really shows it starts to show some relationships here, how these things work together to help us fulfill our calling. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. How? How, are you, how do you walk or behave in a way worthy of this high calling, this, this honor of being called to serve? How do you prove yourself worthy of what behavior well you need to do it with lowliness lowliness that's humility ha ha there it is again remember i said last week humility long suffering they're linked <clears throat> with humility here's another fruit of the spirit come another aspect of the fruit of the spirit that's listed in galatians that's coming right after that humility and gentleness when you're humble you don't tend to get impatient and handle roughly. I uh, think of loved ones of mine that I grew up with and grew up around. There were those who, they did love me, but they were often known as being harsh and rough and impatient. Why is that? because they really didn't have humility. An humble person doesn't have a hard time being patient and handling with gentleness because they're humble and realize I sometimes also need everyone to forbear with me because I don't get it right all the time. And we, we looked at last lesson how, you know, whenever we are impatient, 
how arrogance is built into that model because we're constantly thinking of, oh, you need to get it. You're just being stubborn. You're you're just you should be smarter than this. You know, all this. In other words, I've got it. I'm smart. I am. I'm not stubborn. I I was able to learn it. You can't. So there's arrogance built into that model, and that creates you know that demeans the other party, that lowers them, which means they're less valuable, which means you're free to be a little more rougher and cause a little more damage with our words or maybe our hands. All right. So here they are linked together, lowliness, gentleness, long suffering, fruit of the spirit, bearing with one another in love. And there is the, the, you know, fruit of the spirit of the, the, what's at the core of it all, the most important aspect, love. This is how you bear one another. You don't bear one another love by getting impatient and, acting in a punitive manner out of impatience and anger. That's not bearing one another in love. That's crushing each other in frustration and, and, and disdain. It's not love. If you've ever heard anyone tell you, well, he does it because he loves you, or she says that she talks to you. Nope. That's not coming from love, honey. And, and if you happen to be in the sound of my voice and you're someone who's guilty of supposedly being harsh and being impatient and hurting and scarring, whether it's with words or with, with, with actions or with abuse. No, it's not love. Every time you said it, you were lying to yourself and you were lying to them. What's horrible is that you're doubling the damage you're doing by teaching them that it's love. And if it's your child, they're growing up with that twisted notion that love equals abuse. Love equals emotional damage. Love equals hurting. Love equals, that's the way you show it. It's a lie. It's not love. It doesn't come from a place of love because love has with it humility, lowliness. Love brings with it gentleness. Love brings with it patience. When those things aren't present, it's not love. And I love the last part of this verse. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. This goes back to all of those things being one fruit. You want to parse out love and say, I love you, and rip it away from humility, the lowliness, and the gentleness as you're arrogant and impatient and abusive with them. And you think that you can say, this is love over here. Nope, that's not the Bible love. Bible puts it with lowliness, gentleness, and patience. Those things together are love, are the fruit of the Spirit. So you're not going to keep the unity, and you don't keep unity. You create a break between you and the person. In addition to tearing up the fruit of the Spirit and trying to tear off that one part and claim it's still whole, you've also broken the relationship. Only through lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing one another love, can you keep the unity of the Spirit, of this fruit of the Spirit and the unity of each other in the spirit. In the bond of what? Not the bond of punishment, not the bond of accusation, not the bond of impatience or anger, the bond of peace. If your relationships aren't typified by peace, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You don't know how to love. It's the bond of peace where love thrives, not the bond of anger, not the bond of, of finger pointing and yelling, not the bond of slaps and, and door slamming. No, that's not love. That's abuse. It's wrong. And I'm going to say something now to anyone else who is in a relationship with someone who does that. You aren't supposed to take it. You are supposed to put up with it. It is not okay. Not only should you stand up for yourself, it's your duty to stand up for yourself because you are not only standing up for yourself, you're standing up for others who also come into that person's influence. You're also standing up for your future self and your future relationships by not allowing those really bad, bad, dysfunctional, broken notions to be wired and hardwired into your mind and heart to twist your relationships in the future. It is never okay 
and it is never right to allow anger and to allow wrongdoing and to allow wickedness. It is never okay to stand by and say, well, it's better just to keep the peace. You're not keeping any peace. There's no peace there. Long suffering enables us to bear up a brother along the road. Let's think about it. How does patience help us help a brother? Well, number one, he's heavy. His weight on us for any length of time causes us to be weary, causes pain, could even cause us injury. We got to be patient. You don't want to, if you have to bear a significant amount of weight, the last thing you want to do is to just go to yanking on it because you want to get it over with. Trust me, as a guy who frequently through my life at times has had to lift very heavy things because it's what guys are expected to do in lots of our work. And, and it's what we welcome and even do in our own time sometimes because we're mere men. Um, and we usually find out the hard way. We're not indestructible. You don't want to move something heavy by getting impatient, angry, quick. Your brother is heavy at times. He's, he's weighty. He is a, is a thing full of substance and meaning and promise and potential. He is worth a lot. There's a lot to him. He is a lot of, there's a lot of gold there, but that's a lot. So you can't handle it recklessly and carelessly because you will hurt him and you will hurt you. Patience and long suffering allows you to figure out how to negotiate the extra burden of his life on your shoulders and do so in a way most likely to intelligently get him to the place where he can stand on his feet again without hurting you and hurting him and hurting the relationship between you. That's one way long suffering helps you. Number two, the way patience will help you. He may be weakened because of the mistake he made. In other words, the reason he is the way he is, it could be his fault. It might have been avoided had he made smarter decisions and taken better care of himself, been more dedicated and seen the worth of himself that you see. Yet, if we're impatient, we're risking our own time and our own well-being and exacerbating the original mistake. In other words, we're adding mistake to mistake. We're adding bad lesson to bad lesson, and no one gets smarter. So why do it? Well, number one, it's heavy work. It's hard work. It's long work, long suffering. You do it because of love. He's your brother after all. He is worth patient endurance after all. He's worth the sacrifice as the model of Christ should have shown us. He's worth the sweat. He's worth the time. He's worth the work. He's worth the pain. He's worth the tears. He's worth the patience. He's worth the restraint required to not yell and scream and get mad because you're having to do it. He's worth the patience required so you don't lash out because you're having to repeat yourself. He's worth it. You do it because of love. So if you're doing it because of love to begin with, how about walking in love as you do it? Continue in the love that started it. Keep the love going. Things grow a lot better under the warm light of love than they do under a beating. Do it because of empathy. He is like you in a lot of ways. And you made your own share of dumb mistakes. Remember the title? Be patient because you may be the patient. You will likely make some more yourself. And it could be when you're down and you've made a dumb mistake, it happens to be a mistake that he would never make, and he's smarter than you in that particular area. What if he behaves like you were behaving when you were impatient and unkind and, and wagging your finger and threatening to walk away from it all and leave him lying in the ditch? What if he does the same thing when, it's, when the roles are reversed in the future? You're not going to want that. You would resent that. Well, guess what? Right now the shoe's on your foot. 
And hey, it may never be on his foot, but it could, but, it, but someone else will have done that for you. Trust me, you're not going to get through this life. You're not going to get through this life successfully. I'm not, you may get to the end of your days, but you didn't live it successfully by always being the one on top and always having all the answers and everything was like, never need help. Nope. Trust me, if you've been that person who's never accepted help or had help or need to take a lesson from someone else, well, you've got a whole lot of lessons that you're missing and you're, and you're doing a lot of things wrong still. If you can't demonstrate patient endurance when he needs it, how can you expect patient endurance from someone else whenever you need it? Number three, you do it for the sake of the whole body. You do it for the sake of everyone. Because guess what? You're not the only one connected to that person. Just because you feel aggravated and frustrated, you feel like he's not, you haven't been listened to, you have, you've been ignored, you, you've, someone has, has gone past your advice or they've uh, taken advantage of you, just because you're feeling frustrated doesn't mean you're the only one connected to that person. So if you lash out and you hurt them, you don't just hurt them. You hurt yourself, first of all, because you've broken the relationship and you've, you've missed an opportunity to grow and become a better healer than, than you are. But you also, by hurting them, you've hurt everyone else, which means you've damaged relationships between them and you. That's not a bright choice, is it? Whether you like it or not, the success of the whole body, which includes your own success, directly depends on him making it. And again, you do it because... In fact, you may be the one who is actually mistaken at this moment, and you may be the one who's actually weak, even though you think you're the one in the right, and you're the one strong, and everyone else is messing up. You better eat that humble pie, because it could be you're actually the one in the ditch. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. This is Paul talking. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. He got to use me to demonstrate how to be patient. I gave him lots of good, re good chances to show how patient he was. I really tried his patience, Paul is saying. He did this as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Wow. If we could all take that to heart. Jesus chose me for one reason, because, man, was I enough of a mess that if he showed how to be patient with me, then everyone else ought to know how to be patient too. If he could be patient with me, how much more should I be patient with others? Jesus made Paul a public example of how long-suffering was supposed to work. He knew if he had a reputation for being long-suffering, people would come to him, feel safe and unthreatened around him. People would come to him to improve, to get better. If you find yourself frequently wondering, why is it? that I'm getting left out? Why isn't I'm the one? Why don't people take my advice? Why don't people, why do they only show up when they absolutely need something? Now, on the one hand, probably where your mind is going and it's some indictment against them, how selfish, how they just use people, how they're ungrateful. That's one possibility. Another possibility could be maybe they have to be really, really, really desperate before they risk coming to you for anything because it's such it's such a a an unpleasant painful process to do so otherwise hebrews 6 11 through 12 and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end Diligence until the end. Diligence until the end. Healing until the end. Coaxing until the end. Listening to the end. Really listening to the end. Hearing until the end. That you do not become sluggish, slothful, or lazy, 
but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Diligence until the end. The opposite of that, even when it's wrapped in anger and frustration, it's still lazy. It's still slothful. It's still arrogant. It's still angry. And it's still not love. You better give diligence until the end. You better stay engaged until the end. Because, like this whole series of lessons has been about, you may be the one who's actually in the ditch needing the help. Hmm. Imagine what, what a tragic, pitiful, sad story. To be the guy lying in the ditch, needing the help, lacking the wherewithal, the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, the direction to know which direction is out of the ditch and which direction is in the ditch, keeps trying to trudge ahead, but they're in the ditch, getting deeper, and people don't even dare come near enough to help. Because every time they do, they're encountered by, by an acu accusatory mouth, lashing out, abuse, and anger. Someone telling them how dumb they are, how wrong they are, how they ought to be able to get it by now. What a sad picture is that for that person to languish alone in the ditch, needing help, unable to accept it because they've driven everyone away from them thinking that how right they are and everyone else up there moving on is all wrong. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. I have a feeling that if you find yourself in that position, that you find yourself in that position frequently. That it's that it could be a habit. It could be that you've been falling into ditches for a while, while blaming everyone else for it. How's that working out for you? Do you feel successful? I think it's easy question. It's really not hard. Are you happy in your relationships? Are you finding satisfaction? Or do you keep bumping into dysfunction and reasons to distrust and reasons to grow frustrated and reasons to get angry? If you keep running into that seemingly everywhere and with everyone you know, the common denominator in all those scenarios is you. You got to change. You've got to change you. I said a long time ago, you have no control over anyone else, regardless of how much you keep trying to exert it. The only chance you have at happiness is to change you. That's it. That's it. Fortunately, that person is always close by. That person, you do have some influence and control over. I love you. Can't wait to see you again, which I'm thinking we're going to get do just this next Sunday because we will be back. And, and unless some drastic thing happens, we will probably still have to do the remote thing because things are still pretty scary right now. But at least we can have a conversation. I really la enjoyed when we were able to have that get together before we left. And even though you were some distance apart and we're small enough that we can still have conversations, even though we're sitting in our cars and in chairs around the property there. And, and usually morning times are beautiful here in the summertime in, in northern Maine. So I'm looking forward to that. I love you. Please take care of yourself and walk in humility because you may be the one who needs some help someday. I love you. God bless.